continuing what we started last week. And I want to start this morning with a promise from God's mouth directly. Uh, and then after that we will give context about this promise. And uh, this is this promise that each and every one of us are so familiar with. Because this verse is the best well-known verse of First and Second Chronicles. No other text in the Bible express so clearly the conditions of revival. And this is God telling us, if you pray like this, I will answer in this way. So we want to pay attention because it is God speaking to us. We have all sorts of classes about prayer. We can also, of course, we have the Lord's Prayer that uh, we cannot improve on, but this is in the Old Testament one of the best well-known verse. If my people who are called by my name, is that you? Yes. Will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and restore their land. Last Sunday, we introduced briefly Second Chronicle that we are going to look at uh, for a while. And we began with King Solomon in the beginning of his rule when God asked him after they worship a lot of sacrifices, ask what I shall give you. That's what we kind of stopped there because it was a short time last week. And I want to talk this morning about how we can apply lessons from Solomon's encounter with God for our life and how we can also as a, as a church, because in Second Chronicle and the coming messages, the messages are going to address more ourselves as a church than as individuals. Sometimes we speak to individuals, sometimes we speak as corporately. So it is, if my people, and uh, in the Old Testament it is Israel, in the New Testament we are the church, if my people, and we're going to uh, talk about this, we, how can we become a greater church than we are? We have a great church. Amen. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Lighthouse is, is a small church, but it's in fact a great church. And why is it? Because we have great foundation, first of all. And we have a great history that we just celebrated 28 years. God has done a lot of things in 28 years of our history. And we are proud of it and we celebrate what God has done. Of course, we are not a perfect church. We have a lot of things, a lot of weaknesses and a lot of things that we don't, uh, we don't have. But we have what we have. And we celebrate what God has done. And, it is. and how can we become a greater church? With our expanding on our foundation. So God asked Solomon, what shall I give you? ask, ask me. And we prayed and we closed the service last week and prayer on this. And Solomon asked, uh, give me wisdom and knowledge uh, to govern these people of yours, which is so great. This is your people. I, I'm, I'm a young king. I don't have what it takes. So give me wisdom and understanding. And I want to uh, draw your attention on God answers to that prayer. How God regards prayers and how he, he answers prayer. And we see it in the next uh, scriptures. God answered Solomon. Because this was your heart. This was in your heart. So God first look at the heart. He, he look at the, what's the motives. And we have discussed briefly last week about the purity and the integrity of uh, Solomon's uh, request. He did not ask for uh, uh, wealth and uh, possessions and uh, strength to conquer and all of these things. He asked and regarding himself as being called by God, having received a call from God to serve God in a certain role, and not being confident in his own abilities and to fulfill this role. And as God equip me, make me able to fulfill the role that you have given to me. And God liked that. 
when we pray about the calling of God that He has given us and we want to serve God and we want our life to honor God, God looks at our heart, the purity. James told us this, something similar in the letter of James, chapter 4. When you ask, you don't receive anything because the reason you ask is wrong. You only want to use it for your own pleasure, for your own self-advancement and promotion. So there are things we receive, there are things that are pleasing to the Lord, there are things that is not so pleasing to the Lord. And Solomon here certainly pleased the Lord by asking for wisdom and knowledge. But when you look at God's answers, you will see that God reveals His nature. He gives Solomon not what he asks, he gives beyond what he asks. And that is very important and to, know, to realize that in our relationship with God. And God says, I will certainly give you what you ask. Because you did not ask for riches and power over your enemies and things like that. I will certainly give you the wisdom and the knowledge you requested. But... I'm going to give you much more than that. I'm going also to give you what other people would have uh, requested. The possessions, the wealth, the wisdom, and, and all of these things. He will give so much. So that when we look at the life of Solomon, we can see the effect of God's uh, answering his prayer. And God gave Solomon wisdom and knowledge or understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind is intelligence, is, is ability to discern, is insight, is understanding of society, of the, the, the problems of uh, managing and ruling and governing was like the sand of the seashore. For he was wiser than all other men, and his fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations, and all People, people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So that is awesome when you realize that, that God gave him wisdom and understanding or knowledge beyond measure. And the word knowledge or understanding here uh, in the original Hebrew uh, language is intelligence, skillfulness, ability to argue and to defend your arguments and to present your cause exceeding much. It will be beyond, it will be so much, and the breadth of mind and his intelligence will be. You know, after the Queen of Sheba, you find that in the Second Chronicle, after the Queen of Sheba came and look at Solomon's food, Solomon's servant, the clothing, the wealth, the buildings, the, the, the structures of his organizations, his management uh, style, and uh, how he, he governed and everything. You know what the Bible says? She was breathless. It took her breath away. She could not speak anymore. She was so, so in awe of what she could see. The Bible says there was no more spirit in her, or no more breath in her. And later on she says, you exceed the fame of which I have heard. And James again in the New Testament tells us, if you lack wisdom, you can ask wisdom. So it's just amazing because w when you look at the Old Testament, all the principles that you find in the Old Testament and the, the, the promises, the, the, the scriptures that exhort us in the Old Testament are also found in, in a parallel form in the New Testament. We find a God pleasing, uh, pleased with the Solomon's about asking for wisdom to fulfill his duty to be a good Christian, to be a faithful follower and a good king and a good leader. And he is pleased with that kind of, uh, of uh, prayers. In the New Testament, James, you want wisdom, you're lacking wisdom, you, you want wisdom, ask and it will be given to you. And we know now looking that he gave Solomon so much beyond what he was asking. And God can bring us to a place of saying, wow, God, you are so much better than what I uh, was expecting. And Ephesians, it says, like, uh, beyond what we can think of and ask, God is beyond that. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. This does not guarantee that we will all become wealthy like Solomon. Eh? But if we put God first, 
He will give us a type of wisdom that will enrich our life, that will make our life more meaningful and more rewarding, full, more full, fulfilling, and uh, a greater wealth will be in our life. Wealth is not only money in your pocket. Wealth is a way of life. Wealth is peace when you sleep at night. Wealth is intelligence and your relationship. Wealth is a, a form of a walking with success and confidence in God because God is with you and He bless you. You know, God has given beyond. He has given wisdom and understanding and uh, breadth of mind to Solomon. And it's wonderful to realize this because look at the inheritance that we have received from Solomon. You've received a book of Proverbs. How many of you dwell in Proverbs, receive wisdom from Proverbs, enjoy actually reading the proverb and listening to that? Last week in my daily devotion, I was uh, blessed with e Ecclesiastes. I was listening to that as in my breakfast with my wife, and we were discussing, and we were saying wow to, to what we were uh, listening to, the wisdom and the Song of Solomon. Did you know that uh, Solomon compose 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. You read that in the Bible. And he produced manuals on botany, uh, describing every kind of plant from cedars of Lebanon to the, to the Aesop that grows on walls. He also produced manuals on biology, describing animals, birds, insects, and fish. It's amazing. This guy was so intelligent. God gave him a breath of mind, like something to see wow to his intelligence. Actually, the original language says he spoke. He spoke about these plants and these trees and all of the, the botany. And he spoke about uh, the, the biology and the animals. But the word he spoke in some of the Bible version is he arranged material in order to speak about it. It's like a teacher who prepares his class. It's like a publisher who will prepare a book. He is he's a, he's a scientist. He, his knowledge, he puts it together, he analyzes it, and he brings it together. It's, it's wonderful to, to see that Solomon did that. He's, he's a, he was a genius in his time. He was a genius. And people went from all over the world, and, and his fame, was overwhelming beyond what what they thought of him. Amen. Yeah. Uh, this is this is amazing. My wife and I, when we were in Canada, we went to Ottawa to a science and technology uh, museum, and we went to an amazing. Um, exposition of Leonardo da Vinci, 500 years of genius. And I tell you that it was amazing to see this wonderful presentation. 500 years of, of genius, his invention, his writing, his painting. He was not a genius only in one branch. He was a genius in multitude. You know, did you know, I, I, I learned some things. He invented the first uh, parachute the models of helicopters, of flying machines. Uh, he even had the, um, uh, he, he knew the how, how do you know in, in, in English? I'm losing my English now. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when you go underwater, how do you call this, the, the equipment? Submarine. Uh, not the submarine. The, Deep sea diving outfit. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, he invented that. And uh, oh, wow. Everything that he has done architecture, war machines, because he was, he was, uh, he, he was uh, hired by some of the wealthy men in Italy and then later on the king of France. And uh, so he was paid to just do his research and to compose and to find, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's all I can say. It's like, oh, wow, he's really a genius. And then when I read about, uh, when I'm studying about Solomon, I'm saying, Wow, Solomon is more of a genius even than Leonardo da Vinci. Wow, this is, this is uh, so wonderful. And then Solomon decided to build a house for the name of the Lord. David called it a palace for the Lord God. 
And Solomon told Hiram, king of Tyre, of his desire to exalt the God of Israel. And look how he expressed his desire. Behold, I am about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God and dedicate it to him. The house that I am going to build will be great. Why? Because our God is greater than all gods. And there's something in the book of uh, Chronicles that you, we will come back to that theme is the, Lord, the, the book of Chronicles does not discuss the failings of Solomon, does not discuss the failings of the king of, of uh, Israel. He leaves them aside. He wants to show the greatness of God among his people. And when God bless uh, David and bless Solomon, he is reminding to his people in exile at the time, Remember how God can bless a nation. Look at the time when I was blessing David. Look at the time when I was blessing. If you humble yourself, you come back to me, I will bless you in the same way. So he was building up a message that was given, going to be given to the exile at the time before they would come. So Solomon is a great example of God blessing and blessing a nation through, through blessing the king. And Hiram, the king of Tyre, recognized the connections between God's greatness and Solomon's splendor. He says, because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son, who has discretion and understanding. And Solomon in his prayer prayed later on that when foreigners will pray toward this house, their prayer will be welcomed, their prayer will be answered also, in order that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you. The Queen of Sheba also expressed similarly before the fame of, of Solomon and these things. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on his throne as king for the Lord your God because your God loved Israel and he has established you in all of these things. So they recognize the blessing of the Lord over the ruling and the kingdom of Solomon. That's very important for us. Now let's talk about the glorious uh, presence of the Lord, which should be the goal of our church meeting together, praising the Lord and worshiping. The house of the Lord was finished. It took uh, seven years to build the temple. And that looks something similar to that. You can imagine it took six and that years without all the sophisticated crane. This is a maquette made uh, that represents the building of Solomon, the temple as made by Solomon. Look at how majestic it is. It took seven years only because it took four to five years to King David and King Solomon to gather the material first. As for Solomon's other buildings and his own palace, it took 13 years instead because they also had to prepare materials and everything. So it is glorious to see all of these things. So when the temple was finished and the priests moved the furniture and the equipment inside, Solomon offered thousands of sacrifice. The singers and the musicians were praising and giving thanks joyfully because it was like, wow, so exciting. You can imagine when they inaugurated this kind of temple. Then with these, temp these words, he is good, his faithful love endures forever. At that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. If you look later on, after this, this text here, you will see in, in, in here that the priests could not continue their service because of the glorious presence of the Lord. If you look after, chapter 5 finished like this. Chapter 6, it is Solomon's prayer. And chapter 7, it is God answering Solomon's prayer. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offering and sacrifice, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple 
of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down onto the ground and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, He is good, His faithful love endures forever. I want you to pay attention to a few expressions over here. First one is, of course, the glorious presence of the Lord. Think about this. This is the ultimate goal, isn't it? Why do we come to church every Sunday? Fellowship, shaking hands, singing songs. No, this is all part of something bigger. There's something deeper. There should be something deeper. We are coming to God. We are coming into the presence of God. We are entering His courts with praise. But why? It's so that we encounter the glorious presence of the Lord. This is, this is the glorious presence of the Lord that heals, that transforms, that changes our life. Without the glorious presence of the Lord, uh, why do we go to church? Uh, it's just to feel good, to, to learn a new song? No, we need... It's a good reminder for us. We're talking about God's people coming together. When God's people is coming together, we should seek, we should anticipate, we should desire and yearn for the glorious presence of the Lord. That's the ultimate goal. The last book of the Bible is telling us when the new Jerusalem comes down, the Lord God will dwell among His people. We will be His people. He will be our God. So that is the, the, the theme of the Bible. From the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, man has been separated from God. From that time onward, the plan of redemption is to bring back reconciliation and bring back the promise and the blessing and the presence of God among the people of this world. Jesus Christ died on the cross to reconcile us and bring people from all tribes and language and peoples and generation after generation to Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate mission of the church also to carry this message to bring people to be reconciled so what we are reading in this text is the ultimate goal of worship the ultimate goal of God's people meeting together there's no other purest or greatest goal than this one please say amen to that amen. so that it is something that we must treasure and cherish and think about and pray about uh, this morning hallelujah the second thing i want to draw your attention about in this text is the word fire where is the fire what is the fire why do we need fire Fire is an expression of God's presence. It's like a fire with Elijah, fire with Abraham, fire when God comes and, and burns the sacrifice and God shows his approval and God manifests. He appears and he says, I'm with you. I'm with you, I have heard you, and I'm coming through to you, and here is a manifestation of my power. Fire is coming down. And that's what happened in this place here. When God's people fire, this is one of the remarkable occasions of the, in the Old Testament of God sending His fire to consume sacrifice. And this is a dramatic and visible proof of God's approval on His people. The fire was kept alive symbolically through the, the candlestick and, and through the, the burning fires at the altar. In the morning, they would light fire. In the evening, the fire was kept alive uh, until the captivity in Babylon. But symbolically for us, the fire. Why do we need fire? Do we need fire? Should God still manifest dramatically His presence in our midst? In the book of Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, the promise came in chapter 1. What came in chapter 2? The tongues of fire came. The fire was there as a symbol. The fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit is the God's presence that needs to be kept alive in the church. You know, when you look at church history, you will see a, a repeated uh, tragedy. A church movement is born. A revival is going on. 
then politics comes in and it grows and the liturgy and, uh, and uh, uh, hierarchy comes and uh, rules and regulation comes and then it becomes stale, stagnant and then it loses the fire. Then a revival come and other groups come and goes on. So Lighthouse was born out of a revival here and 28 years ago. Do you remember? There was a fire. There was a fire. Amen? There was a fire here, remember? So 28 years later, where's the fire? Is go the fire of God going to keep on burning in Lighthouse? Amen. It is up to us. Amen? Amen? It is up to our desire, our thirsty we are. Here there is. They fell face down before the Lord and worship and praise the Lord. You would think that when God does something as dramatic as he did in this place here, that people would have a, a, a response of fear. Judgment is coming down. Instead, it is praise and joy. You know, when the true presence of God will be manifested, it will be joy in the house. It will be freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There will be a, an uplifting a feeling of, of a freedom and th things like that. And we need to, to remember that these are God's desire for the church from generation to generation. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The emphasis here was on the goodness and the, on the mercy of God. They are celebrating the goodness and the mercy of God. Hey, hallelujah. I am so happy today. Amen. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Look at the nonsense amount of sacrifice that was done on that day. 22,000 cattle, 120,000 sheep and goats. Try to imagine the scene. The blood, the time, the manpower, the, 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 the carcass, the dead carcass of the animals, the, the moving, the going, and the coming of, of this is this is beyond even imagination. Try to imagine the smell and the sound and uh, how long would that is have, have taken. But that is how they wanted to honor the Lord. It's like amazing, amazing, overwhelming, nonsense. And there is also something, another lesson in that. Sacrifice, blood sacrifice. We needed blood sacrifice at that time. We need blood sacrifice today. If we are going to be a church alive in the Holy Spirit, we need to remember Jesus Christ. We exist by Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. It's in Christ that we have access to God and all of the promises and the power of God. Keep in mind Christ's sacrifice to come into God's presence. Another one, I want you to look carefully at verse 6. This is talking to us here this morning. Look at verse 6. The priests took their assigned position. I like that. When I read that, I said, yes, this is how the church has to be. Each one of us, we are called by God to join a local church. This is Lighthouse. This is our church. We are accepted here. You are welcome here by the Lord first and by the church members. Each one of us have a role, a ministry, a calling, something to do, something to uh, collaborate, to, to add up to the life of the church. And we took our assigned position, each one in their position of service, just as we should. We are doing things in the church. We are active in the church as unto the Lord. It's part of our sacrifice. It's part of our going to church. Church is not for a spectacle. You know, many churches, I'm not criticizing and I'm not uh, talking against any church. And I pray for the unity of churches around the world. And there are so many great churches even here in Hong Kong. But many churches today, they turn out the light, there's smoke machines, and uh, the, the group, the music group are all on the stage. Yeah, you, you can see they, they are elevated, 
and it, you are sitting there in the dark and you are listening to people singing for you. Here, we want you to sing. We want you to be part of the singing. We want you to sing to the Lord, not to just watch about, but to be active in, uh, in the ministry. Amen? Amen. Also, look at the, the, the structures and what happened in the, the, this text. Do you wonder the, about the place of singing in our worship? Singing music, is it important? You know, uh, should we do it? Why should we do it? Look at this text. This is, they are doing it with all of their heart. They are singing. They have instruments that David, uh, you know, created or made a model of many uh, instruments. It was very creative. They are practicing. They are singing. It's important that we come into his court with singing and with worship. It's part of who we are, it's part of what we do, it's liberating, it is, it is a way to uh, wake us up after uh, we, we have been on the train and a big week of uh, work and burdens and frustrations and tensions. You come to church and you can be set free, you can be elevated by the good worship into the presence of the Lord. Say amen, please, amen. to that. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And then we continue. At the end of the celebration, Solomon sent the people home. How did they go home? And this is how we should go home after Sunday service. Joyful and glad. So I was thinking, joyful and glad, isn't it about the same word repeated twice? But the second expression, glad, is actually uh, good of heart. That's the, the word used. Like your heart feels good. You're, you're joyful, but your heart feels good. You have received something from coming to the temple, singing and praising in the glorious presence of the Lord, and the fire of the Holy Spirit, and all of these elements that we have, and our participation. We are living glad, and our heart is satisfied we our heart is feeling good amen and this is how we should go back and also when they go back they are joyful and glad because they are also remembering david and they are remembering solomon they are remembering their history they are remembering what they are part of they are part of a church that has 28 years of, of history. And God is continuing and you are here today. In God's plan, in God's generation, in God's time. It's not a mistake that you are here, that I am here. We are here today and we can celebrate with gladness of heart our history. Expecting more to come from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And then we continue. So Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. Seven years for one, 13 years for the other. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and on his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Wow. This is the second time that God appeared to Solomon at this time. Amen? If you look at the next uh, scriptures here, uh, wow, what is that? Is that here? Oh yes, here. After it took Solomon 20 years to build the Lord's temple and his own royal palace, and after Solomon finished building the Lord, this is from a uh, king here, uh, the royal palace and all the other constructions, projects he had planned, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time in the same way he appeared to him at Gibeon, which was the first time when he had offered sacrifice after he had been inaugurated king. And he went to Gibeon, which was the Moses uh, temple at the time. And the Lord said to him, I have answered your prayer. And it is actually extraordinary. First time, 
and Gibeon, God appeared to him. And that's when he says, I will uh, answer your prayer, give you more wisdom and all this. Second time, at the dedication of the temple, the fire came down, which is in itself an answer and a manifestation and an appearance of the Lord God to him. Approval of, of, his, of his prayer. And now, another time, second appearance, but a third manifestation, you know, after a long time, but God is still uh, with him. I have answered your prayer, and then he says, my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Spurgeon tells us about uh, this text that we want, you and I as Christians, we want renewed appearances, fresh manifestations, new visitations from on high. And I recommend to those of you who are now getting on with life, that while you thank God for the past, we're happy for what God has done, and we look back with joy to his visits to you in the early days that you now seek and ask for a second visitation of the Most High. Isn't that great? This is, this is something that we should aim, that we should desire, that should be part of us. Yes, we are happy that God really did something, and we are glad if God has shown himself in special revelation, some special moments, a vision, a, a dream, or like a, a word coming alive to you, a miracle, a divine moment in the past. But what about the future? What about now? Can God do it again? Then after all this time, God told Solomon, I have answered your prayer. The assurance of an answered prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. House of sacrifice, house of prayer. Sacrifice is prayer are the two sides of a coin, uh, theologian has said. Now let's look at the condition of prayer and we will close with this. That's our opening uh, verse. I told you I was going to start with that and then go to context and finish with that. At times, God says in, after Solomon prayed in chapter 6, when you come to chapter 7, at times God says, I might shut heavens. I, I might be angry with my people. I might, you know, cut my blessing because of the sinfulness of the people or whatever. Whatever happens, a famine, a war, uh, anything, disasters, I might shut up the heavens like my presence is not coming to you. Then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. God himself here promised to hear our prayers, the prayer of his people. Who else in the world can guarantee that? To care, to intervene, to, to restore, to heal, to forgive and to because uh, as a result of prayer. Now let's look at some of the expression and the condition of prayer that God himself is given to us. The model of prayer that God himself tells us. My people, my people God is talking to you and to me, calling you my people. The connection is intimate. We belong to him. He loves us. He purchased us, my people. If my people, if you are my people this morning, say amen. amen. Uh, who are called by my name. It's also another identification. I bear the name of God. I am an ambassador of, of God. I am a child of God. The seed of God lives in me. There's an identification. The name of God is with me. When I am seen in my, with, with my friends or my family, they see a Christian, a, a, a Christian, a follower of Christ. My name is identified, uh, the name of God is identified with me. People know I, am, I belong to, to Christ. There's an identification. I bear his name. Humble themselves and pray. The, the humility is very important. It's to admit that we cannot help ourselves 
and our, our own problems, out of our problems. We cannot do that. But if we are honest, many of us, at times, we feel that we can do it by ourselves. We are very confident. We are very independent. We have money in the bank. We are intelligent. We have enough experience. We have friends. We have resources. For many times, we can take care of ourselves. So humble ourselves is what Jesus called in the Beatitudes, uh, the spiritual poverty, the one who is poor in spirit, the one who can recognize our spiritual poverty. If we want the Lord's power in our lives and in our church, we have to admit that our abilities, our great plans, our organizations, our missions, our worship, it's not perfect. It's not enough. It's, it's not yet there. It's, we, we need God in our, in our life and in our church. It cannot do the job for the glory of God. Everything that we do cannot necessarily bring the glory of God. We do a lot of our own things that bring glory to ourselves and not necessarily to, to God. When we humble ourselves before Him, we are admitting that we have that we say, no, no faith in my ability, but instead we are proclaiming our faith in God's ability. Then there is the seek my face. If you seek my face, you're seeking, you're searching, you are yearning for. There is a desire, there is a thirst here. It's like, you know, many times we read, this is, this is such a popular and many misquoted or often quoted that we forget to stop at what it means. Seek my face. Seek God. To seek to find. And to seek regularly. It's not uh, only when I get in trouble at some point. But it's like an attitude of seeking God regularly to request, to desire, a yearning to enter into the presence of God. Turn from their wicked ways. Is to be different. Is to want to be different. Is to want to stop what is wrong. The attitude that is wrong. The, the various type of attitude and habits and weaknesses and things that we gratify or things that we tolerate, things, the things that we just justify as not a big deal in our lives, but that is not pleasing and it, it, it is taking something away from our devotion, from the fire of God. It's doing something not good in our uh, relationship with God. Let me give you a partial list of things that we may think of, like idols that uh, maybe lead us into sins. Money or job, which is very common. We work a lot, it comes first. Possessions, positions or status or reputation, what people will think of us, it makes us pretend instead of humbling ourselves. Pride and hypocrisy, do we have that in our lives? Yes? Okay, you don't say yes. Okay, fine. A relationship or a person, sexual immorality or lust, cheating or stealing, a habit or a habit, or any number of things that you and I may have put before God in our lives. Anything that may uh, take something away from the Lord. There is something in our life that we need to clean, and that is what it means to turn from their wicked ways. Some form of things that we have accepted as part of our life th that does not help us to grow in the Lord, to maintain the fire of God in our life, that we have become more religious and more accepting of these things. Then we can anticipate the confirmation from God. God will send revival. He will heal. He will hear us. Then I will hear from heaven. If we take care of the if. We take care of the if. If we, there's no, there's no, if we don't do it. So you see, in today's modern church, prayer, worship, and attitudes, 
It's like it's enough to turn to God. Just turn to the Lord. Just cry out to God. But according to God, it's not enough. You know, you have concerts today. You have people like raising hands, singing to God. We have a lot of things going on today. But is that enough to God? God says, if my people humble, turn from. So certain things must also be practiced that we have neglected. Repentance is not something that we practice anymore. We don't need repentance anymore. We just need to just speak to the Lord your prayer. Just, you have a problem in your life, just go to the Lord. So yes, it's true. There is grace, there is acceptance. But the Lord says something more. There's a sin. If there is a sin or a sinful attitude, there should be a repentance. There should be a humbling, which we have in our modern church life and sermons and message, just removed to make everybody feel good and God is good, God is love. Just, just speak to God. Just it's God, everything will be good. It's just like you know, the magic wand, wand, just God will make it right. But God says, listen, I will hear your prayer. I will heal you. I will forgive you if my people. So I think this morning it's important, especially in the time that we live, that we consider the Word of God. We'll forgive their sin and heal. It means He will help us. He will bless us with His power, with His fire, and with His glorious presence. And then closing the last verse, now my eyes will be open. Sister Penina, maybe you will come with the musicians. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. I want you to look at my eyes, my ears, and my heart. That's a lot of God's attention. My eyes. He's looking, he's searching, he's, he knows you, he sees you. My ears, he's waiting, he's listening, he's attentive. My ears are attentive. But it says my heart. You know that in the Old Testament there's not a lot of mention about the heart of God and, and the sense of, of love using the expression the heart of love this is one of the rare scriptures of the Old Testament it says my eyes and my heart will be there God is telling us so this promise of course you will say oh it's in the Old Testament it's about the temple but let me remind you how much more confident are we that God will be attentive to our prayers when we offer our prayers in the name of Jesus. He is a much better temple, a much better priest, a much better mediator, a much better sacrifice, and he gives a much better and assured uh, uh, access to God this morning. My eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. I want to sing that wonderful last song we sang this morning in closing and ask you to, to consider your, your role in the church. Think about Lighthouse this morning. Where are we going? My people. It's about my people. It's about us praising and worshiping and looking for the Lord's glorious presence and wanting the fire of God and, and receiving healing and supernatural and all of the best and the greatest things and continue for as long as the Lord returns to be the church that God, to be a people of God who are called by His name. Would you please stand this morning? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we read Verse 14 together. Let's go back to verse 14 of the sermon. The, at times I might shut up the heavens. Just 
click on the presentation and that will be the foundation of our prayer time in closing this morning. Let's read it out loud, verse 14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and restore their land. It is up to you to practice this and pray according to God's condition. My people called by my name, humble themselves and pray. Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways and I will hear you, heal you, forgive you, help you, be with you. Hallelujah, I will wait for the Lord.